Let's see what's up first here. Four cap sideways. Uh, let's start here. Uh, Jetram, do you have a favorite translation of the Poetic Edda for someone interested in reading the stories? Um, I personally, when I, uh, I'm not translating by myself, uh, do use uh, Caroline Larrington's translation of the Poetic Edda, though I've heard Jackson Crawford's is also totally fine. Pretty much any scholar, any translation uh, by a modern scholar is going to be pretty good. Uh, but, you know, those do both cost money, and if you don't mind, if you are truly just reading for a casual purpose, then the site villasbau.org has the Henry Adam Bellows translation from 1890 something, which is public domain at this point, alongside the original Old Norse. Uh, I would only ever, ever use the Bellows translation for purely casual reading. It is not a particularly good translation. It does a lot of really nonsense stuff. But if you're just in it for like understanding the material, uh, or for just to casually enjoy the material and to get a little bit closer to what the original stories are, look like, it's, that's totally fine. Uh, next question from Watcher. Did Skald have a magic or oracular function, or was I just lied to at an academic conference an hour and a half ago? Oh boy, this is a big thing. The answer is... unclear. So, by the time we have really reliable accounts of what Skalds are doing, they are truly just court poets. Well and truly and purely and nothing else. That being said, uh, in the Viking Age and with the internal evidence of some of the Eddic and Skaldic poems, it does suggest that these were intended to be performed in a pseudo-dramatic sense. Uh, Terry Gunnell is the big scholar on this. His first publication, The Origins of Drama in Scandinavia, goes into this in quite a lot of depth. So, something like Skirnismal, uh, might actually be intended to actually be told by a scout as part of a ritual as people go from place to place to place and the different scenes of the poem and that sort of as part of potentially a springtime or a seasonal ritual? Not super clear. Uh, similarly, or kind of similarly, uh, how Konarmal uh, has been interpreted very recently uh, by uh, Simon, Simon Nugor uh, as his PhD thesis, as something that should be r was read by a male and a female uh, poet that is potentially part of some sort of ritual or performative uh, movement of the spirit to Valhot. So, there is definitely room for active religious uh, material. So, it's super cool, uh, and so I think we can say sometimes they had like a ritualized function. I don't want to say like magical or oracular, right? I don't want to say this. The reason I don't want to say this is that this is, uh, there is a social person who does this. That is the Spaukona, or the Völva, uh, plural Völer. Uh, the way you spell that is... V. Uh. So, this is literally a serious, probably itinerant, probably a uh, single, probably old, that goes around and performs divination rituals, and sometimes even more rituals with like weather manipulation stuff. Uh, so, Eric Sagaroida tells of this big ritual and a famine in Greenland, where a Svalkona comes, uh, literally, I think she's called, uh, what is it, Litelva? Uh, anyway, her name I think is Thorbjörg, I think. Uh, 
Anyway, she there's a famine and a plague going on in Greenland. It's terrible. And so she shows up at the farm of Rahtali, the Eric the Red's farm, and does this like two-day divination ritual, where first she examines the farm and its properties, and then the next day they sacrifice uh, one of all the animals in the farm and feed her the hearts while everyone else eats everything else, while a woman sings a chant or a galdur. And in doing that, uh, the CRS claims that a bunch of spirits that were thus far unwilling to speak to her suddenly had gathered around and she was able to talk to them, enter into this the spirit world, and ensure through talking to them, unclear whether it's just they are promising her or she is persuading them to end the plague, end the famine, and then she proceeds to tell the futures of everyone at the ritual. A scald does not do that. That is 100% the job of a seeress. And so as far as that goes, those are not the same thing. Question number next. Uh, let's grab one from Discord for the sake of... Balancing... Um, do, 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 do. Uh, so was Lo one about Loki, you know, uh, from Lewis. Was Loki on the same recognition as Odin as far as Norse gods go, since he was seen as Odin's brother in some translations? Okay, so... I should be clear, we don't know. He's incredibly important in the material that we have. He's incredibly important in the prose era. He's incredibly important in Vilaspau. A uh, Vilaspau and Skama is where the idea of Loki eating a half-burned heart comes from. Uh, he shows up in Hoistland, but as a as a, actually a fairly major player in that. Uh, he shows up a lot in the Prozida in a lot of context, and obviously, uh, in the the Lokasana, he is the main character and confesses to being the reason why Baldur is dead. But. I don't think we can push Loki any farther back than the 10th century. I don't think he exists in any significant form as a prominent deity before then. We just don't have any evidence for it. My speculation, uh, I think the most probable thing we can say is that in the early 10th century, uh, whether due to dynastic shifts or due to something else, in an elite Norwegian context, Loki starts to become really prominent. This belief spreads into the Orkney Islands, which had close ties to uh, Norway and the Norwegian court, and from there it also spreads into uh, northern England and Northumbria, which is where we get the Gosforth Cross, which shows Loki being bound. But I don't know whether he's worshipped outside of, whether there's belief in him outside of Norway. And I don't think there's belief in him outside, before the 10th century. Uh, the Snapton Stone was found in Aarhus, Denmark. It's the hearthstone that probably has Loki uh, depicted on it. It dates to about 1000. It was made in Norway. So, same problem. Uh, and the Vian amulet might also have been made in Norway, even though it's found in Denmark. So, as far as that goes, we... We can't say. There are no place names. There are no place names. And so, whether he was a regional god that came to more prominence, or whether he was a kind of folkloric spirit that assumes the role of a god, or what's going on is totally lost. All I can say is, in the literary mythology, as opposed to pre-Christian Nordic religions, He's super important. So, uh, next question. Let's find another one. Let's see. You know, let's get another one on magic. Also, Wikipedia. Good combinations. I have read, on Wikipedia of all places, that men performing magic would often be viewed as effeminate, possibly even homosexual, in all our societies. 
Are you aware of any sources for this? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So the concept being described here is what's known as Erki. This most literally translates as unmanliness uh, with a specific side of sexual submissiveness. This is a super common thing in the law codes uh, in Scandinavia, specifically like Graugaus, the Icelandic law code, and Gulatingslag, the Norwegian law code. And accusations of this were a big deal. Like, this is the highest form of slander to falsely accuse someone of this, and a little bit more complicated than it seems, but there are situations in which a valid response to an accusation of Erki is to kill your accuser. That counts as proving your innocence. Obviously, this makes Odin really complicated because Odin is well known for doing magic. Uh, he kind of breaks the rules, and as far as gender models go, there uh, might it might be valid to think of three genders: male, female, and magic user. This doesn't totally work, but I am personally a fan of this model. Uh, I think it's certainly a better model than some of the other ones that I proposed. But uh, yeah, male, female, magic user. Uh, so, lots going on there to deal with. Um, but male sorcerers do, are, do exist in the sagas. The saga corpus across all genres, uh, almost all genres, really have like magic users. And you need a sorcerer on hand, it's bad for you to resort to using them. But you need one on hand just in case. And so magic users are more often coded female. And in fact, the term troll, which is often used for magic users, is where we get the English word troll, uh, is female coded in the oldest material. So yeah, I don't know, we've got we've got a lot of them, but an example of that is in a Grete Saga Ausmunderson. Uh, I believe it's a sorcerer, not a sorceress, who infects Gretir's leg, leading to his death. I believe. Otherwise, you have that style of saga, in which a Ingamunder the Old must go against a sorcerer who has imbued 20 cats with the spirits of trolls. So yeah, there, there are actually like giant troll cats running around, and people were afraid to go against them because vicious cats. And then in Ingimunder does, and he does great, because he's the hero of the saga. So yeah, this is a really well-defined term, uh, and absolutely, it, it is in, improper for non-hero, yeah, non-hero people to do it, uh... I guess we'll put in an exception there. Exception Odin plus Odin like heroes. So, Eir Skatla Grimson, Sigurd the Dragon Slayer, uh, I believe the actual attribution uh, exists I think Gula Tingslug attributes it to Haraldur Feinherr Harfagri that uh, male sorcerers would be ostracized. Anyway, tangential note Wikipedia? Old Norse Wikipedia is pretty good. It was made by some grad student probably 10 years ago. And so it's out of date. It, it's out of date. Uh, it doesn't have the cutting edge of scholarship. But it's pretty good. It's a really good catalog of where things are mentioned in texts. Its interpretations are a bit out of date. Uh, 
Uh, KJ, uh, you seem to remember Loki and, Loki and Odin accusing each other of this at some point. This is in Lokasena. Yes. Uh, question number next from excellent Twitch mod, uh, Raptorus. I've seen people can constantly point to the Northern Lights as being a source for Norse mythological ideas. How much does this idea hold up from an academic standpoint? Not at all. The Aurora is never mentioned in the medieval material. It, uh, I don't have a whole lot else great to say about that because, uh, yeah, there is, it is hard to make an interpretation of it based on the fact that it's not really used. Uh, the ideas of it being, I don't know, somehow the flames of, like, the Valkyries writing, uh, I guess, let me put an asterisk in this. Because, uh, Nyo Saga, describing the Battle of Clontarf, which took place on Good Friday 1014 between the, uh, Kingdom of Dublin, the Norse Kingdom of Dublin, with support from the Orkney Isles, against Brian Bordu of uh, Ireland. As part of that, there's claims of seeing the Valkyries riding across the sky and landing and leaving trails of fire behind them, and when the poor person like follows them to see what's going on, sees the Valkyries or Norns weaving a tapestry out of human bits. That might be an Aurora? But it's not actually identified as the Aurora, so yeah. Additionally, from 1250, we have a text called Konung Skuxia, or the Mirror of King, uh, or of a King, which says that the uh, that they're a Greenlandic thing. Um, that I don't know how that works, given that Iceland totally has them, as does Norway, but claims that they're a Greenlandic thing, and that it's probably actually fires coming, like, cold fire coming off the glaciers, is the interpretation that they go for. So, we've got a whole bunch of questions coming out, thanks to um, excellent Twitch mods helping out. Uh, so, uh, do, 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 do. do any of the Norse, uh, hang on, let me tab over to here. Do any of the Norse conceptions of afterlife living here in exactly the world we live in right now, but without evil? Not really. Uh, Villespaugh probably is perhaps the best one of this, of the post-Ragnarok, uh, of a semi-paradisical thing where uh, Baldr and Höver leave Hell, and Vidar and Vauli, and Magni and Modi all meet at Ivavetlir, where the gods first met each other at the creation of the world, and they find the golden taff pieces, or it's often translated as chess even though they're not the same game, but the golden game pieces uh, of the gods. But the last stanza of Vullisbau is how Nidhugger is flying over the land with the... with corpses clutched in his pinions. I think it's most plausible to read that as just saying, by the way, this isn't paradise, right? This isn't the kingdom of heaven or, like, the renewed city of Jerusalem or any of that. This is still a mortal world. The world continues and we don't know what happens after that, but it is still a mortal world and death still exists. Otherwise, we have something like Ibn Fadlan, 
which says that there is a life without evil or pain in the spirit world. Uh, as part of the ritual, uh, in between two rounds of ritualized sexual assault, uh, the victim is lifted three times over a fake doorway, and on the third time explains that she sees the ma her master there having a picnic on the grasses. Let me go to him. So, yeah. Not the exact same world. Uh, though, you know, Austin Town, you make a great comment there. What about characters going on living in their mounds in the sagas? In E.G. Nyaula with Gunnar of Hlidarendi, singing and dancing in his burial mound. This is complicated. Undead are a mess. There is nothing... By and large, nothing good comes of undead, and they are often actively the evil in the world, rather than continuing in the world without any evil. Uh, but Gunnar is like the one good undead that I am aware of in the entire Norse corpus. But there is, you know, undead are kind of an indication that the spirits of the deceased could still inhabit physical form in this world with all of its flaws and foibles. And usually be a be bad news. Uh, yes. Let's get to that question since I have seen you posted it several times, Rage Master. Let's get to it. Do you think the disappearance of sun worship is related to climate change in the region? I think it is influenced by climate change in the region. Uh, the argument for this is made uh, in a couple of sources. Um, the most recent one is Neil, pa Cri bleh, Neil Price and Bo Graceland uh, in 2015, arguing that the Fimbulvetter should be interpreted, uh, or could be interpreted, I should say, as a distant cultural memory of the climatic anomaly in... Uh, caused by a double volcanic eruption in 536 and 540 CE that co just makes an absolute freaking mess of things. It has massive consequences in Scandinavia and the material culture changes really dramatically. Uh, Anders Andrian also talks about it in 20, his 2014 book and I think it is reasonable to assume that there is some influence going on there that uh, literally weakens solar radiation on a climatic level causes cultural effect or some perceived loss of faith in the power of solar worship, that could result in some pretty big changes. However, I think attributing it solely to climate change would be simplistic. We'd be rather extremely simplistic, actually. Uh, there are a lot of factors that go into changing cultural history, and unfortunately our source material is too thin to say much more than there was a change. And we don't know what it was a change from, but we know it was a change to something much closer to Norse mythology as we know it. Uh, why are there so few studies of Loki from Kappa Crab? Short answer, funding. It's a... Uh, funding is a problem because ultimately none of us can afford to do research if we aren't being paid for it. So... Doing the big sorts of comprehensive, in-depth studies of gods of the way that was done in the 50s and 60s just isn't viable in the modern academic market. It's seen as simplistic, and it's seen as not sufficiently interdisciplinary. It's seen as repeating old scholarship. And so there just aren't a lot of dedicated studies of Loki. There are some I haven't read because I don't know German well enough to be able to read the untranslated ones. 
But yeah, that's ultimately a reality of modern academic study, is that we have some problems. Hmm. So, we have a uh, so many questions. Uh, let's see if I can grab another one from the Discord because it's been a moment since I did one from there. Uh, do 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 do. do. Okay. Tomsk asks, how much does the idea that Loki is gender fluid or otherwise gender non-conforming in some fashion have a basis in the sources that we have? Uh, the big point here are there are two attestations of Loki giving birth to things. The first one is in the Prose Edda, in which uh, Loki turns into a mare, and then after that, uh, until Loki turns back into not a mare, Snorri is pretty consistent about just saying the mare. And just like not not dropping the hint. Uh, I guess we could also vaguely reference Thrymskvila, in which uh, Loki does a cross-dressing, uh, and the text says the handmaiden as the Smooth talking, persuading Thrymir that Thor is totally Freya, don't worry about it. It doesn't say Loki did it, it says the Handmaiden did it. The third one is Vilispau and Skama. Which Vilispau and Skama was known by Snorri, it's, and is actually including the Codex Regius, but is the same oral tradition as the longer other Vilispau, but is otherwise a totally different poem. That disagrees quite radically uh, about the Vilispau tradition. So, Loki eats the heart of a eats a half burned heart, gives birth to the mother of all trolls and wicked things. Uh. Is that Loki as Hell's mother? Potentially. But that is unfortunately interpretation and interpolation rather than necessarily active knowledge. So basically, uh, there is some grounding for it uh, to think about it. It's not something I think would be actively part of Viking Age religious belief, though I don't want to push that too strongly. The people doing working with uh, critical queer theories have done some amazing work, uh, and this will be a question like uh, that may be talked about, actually. Uh, Amy Jefford Franks might have an episode of her podcast Vikings Are Gay about it. And... Uh, actually, let me make sure I am referring to Amy correctly. Do do do. Sorry, give me just a moment here. Da 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 da. -da. Oh, sorry, they. Yep, that's what I, was, that's what I thought. Uh, so their podcast, Vikings Are Gay, uh, sorry, is fabulous, and you should all go support them. So uh, I believe they have an episode on Loki and gender fluidity, and I would absolutely trust their interpretation uh they went through the same master's program I did. 
and are absolutely wonderful, ab an absolutely wonderful person and a brilliant scholar to boot. So I would ref field that question over to them. Okay, we have so many quadrillions of things. So, uh, next one. Valhut. We can be very sure. Uh, our best thing, our best source that lets us be sure is, uh, come on. Let me italicize. Whatever. How con armal? I've mentioned this one before. Haakon the Good was a Christian king who was buried as a pagan, according to his saga. And his personal friend Avendur composes this poem, uh, welcoming him into Valhar. It's a like discussion between him and a Valkyrie about entering Valhar and what Odin's reaction will be. So this lets us really confidently say that Valhut is a believed in afterlife in the mid 10th century, in a Norwegian, in an elite context. I think we have reason to think it's significantly older than that. Both linguistically, the fact that it's just Hall of the Slain, uh, and I believe there are some pictorial representations that might be it from like the 8th century. So, right, we have reason to think that this is actually genuinely really old. Folkvanger is a little less certain, but... Uh, also, Grimnismal, uh, I should say. Grimnismal is one of the oldest. And it mentions Valhut. So, as far back as we have source material, we have source material about Valhut. So, on the same vein, uh, the idea that warriors die uh, are taken to Valhut by the Valkyrie to be in, to be there, to fight and drink, until Ragnarok. Not until the end of time. Until Ragnarok. This is the Einherjar, and that pretty much sums up the entire myth. And it's just, that's just a thing that's said in the Prose Edda, and is suggested uh, in Haukon Armal, or almost explicitly said in Haukon Armal, and in Njalsaga, thanks to the Daradaliot, uh, or the poem the Valkyries are singing as they're weaving the thing at the Battle of Clontarth. Uh, and it's really well attested in some of the other sagas. Uh, Erbegia saga suggests something that might also be close to that. Though, it's actually down inside a mountain in Iceland, rather than up in the heavens. But anyway, as long as, as far as that goes, that is extremely, extremely much part of the thing. Okay. Next up. More questions on the Northern Lights. Is there any way that they could have not known about the Northern Lights? They almost certainly they knew about the Northern Lights. Why they are not a prominent part of the mythology is actually unknown. So, yeah. Uh, another one, let's see, let's get another one here. Uh, can we talk about a little bit more about how we actually figure out Okay. 
We mentioned scholarship evaluating how reliable certain sources are. Can we talk a little bit more about how we actually figure them out? I.e. when we figure out what's uh, what's good, what's unreliable, what's otherwise dubious. So this is luckily very, very recent work that's been doing it. This is an ongoing thing. Uh, thanks to a huge research and reception project led by Margaret Clooney's Ross at the University of Sydney that has been doing a lot of this work. And so basically I'll use Adam Abraman as the case study here. Basically, what happened here, actually, give me just a moment, I want to make sure I do this one justice. By the way, th this is the thickness of books I recommend sometimes. So, do 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 that's Paul the Deacon, Ortego Gentis. Paul's words. Okay. So. Uh, this book is $140. It is not bad for an academic book, but it still is a lot of money. <laughs> um, anyway. So. Let's find it. Uh, so, in order to identify Adam Abraman's uh, Friho, essentially, uh, what uh, Henrik Jansson did is look at Frankish things, which we have a lot of from the reign of Charlemagne onward. So, in the Capitularium of 1802, for example, Charlemagne demanded severe punishments from the bishops for those who committed incestuous fornication. If the perpetrator did not comply with bishop's sentence, he should be brought before the emperor himself, who would remember the case of incestuous fornication that a certain Fricko committed against a nun of God. Uh, quoting the Latin memores exemplo, quote, de incestis factum est, quote, Fricko perpetra perpetravit in sanctimonia sanctimoniali dei. Capitularia Regum Francorum, 195, number 33. And this is actually a well-known story about how a der Teufel der Unzucht uh, battered a nun, uh, citing another work from 1957. The story is otherwise unknown. So, Frico is, uh, you know, I cognate to Friho, what Adam Abraman uses. It's otherwise unknown, but, uh, under the Latin equivalent of priapus, uh, which is also a word for just penis, uh, he is used, like Charlemagne's Frico, to de designate problems within the church when Adam of Bremen's contemporary, Benzo of Alba, warned he King Henry IV against appointing bishops, those priests who adorned priapus, i.e. who liked having sex. Horny go bonk. So, that's... I mean, that's a magnificent bit of scholarship, uh, pulling together Frankish internal evidence with Adam of Bremen, with Frankish cognates from quite a long time earlier, uh, and tying that into a broader folk tradition in order to throw doubt on the identification of Friho as Freyr, even though they seem to both be derived from actual Freyr idols from the Viking Age, and so the identification is not totally off base. For Tacitus, Tacitus is really easy to prove as totally unreliable because, one, he never went, and two, he is incredibly polemical about how much contemporary Rome sucks. We'll get there, AC. I, I do have feelings, but we'll get there. Okay. Uh, next up. Da, 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 da. All 
are we aware of any mentions of the Sami people in Norse mythological readings? Uh, I have read theories on Skadi, perhaps being vaguely inspired by the Samis, but I believe this was portrayed as a stretch. So, the Sami people get absolutely shafted. Uh, research is ongoing into the ways that Sami belief actually influenced Norse ones. For a long time in scholarship, the completely insane but accepted stance was that Sami peoples had basically no influence on Norse mythology. That's utterly nuts, uh, but that was where we were. Uh, that has changed, and research is still ongoing. Uh, it is widely accepted by the leading scholars of the field, including John Lindo and Jens Peter Schutt and Christopher uh, Richard Cole, that we cannot fully understand the Prozeta without looking to Sami beliefs. And so... Stuff hasn't quite been published yet, but I know there are some projects in the works on Sami uh, influences in Norse material. But in the saga corpus, the Sami people do show up. Uh, in that style of saga, there is uh, a ritual where the leader like doesn't actually want to go to Iceland, but he has been told that there's a prophecy that he's going to go to Iceland. And so he summon some Laplanders from across the mountains uh, to do a ritual to attempt to identify what's going on. Uh, and they sit in the sauna for three days and don't eat or drink, and then afterwards they say, oh yeah, so we found your thing in Iceland in like this spot, go there until you find it, and when you find your amulet there, that's where you, that's where you should set up your farm. Okay, sure, let's go for it. Um... Uh, but, oftentimes, they are portrayed as magic users and quasi-monsters. Uh, in Harald Saga Harfari, uh, Snorri, once again, thanks Snorri, probably, uh, mentions that for a while, uh, Haraldur had a wife called uh, Snæfrýður, who was the, a Sami princess. And when... Uh, she died, he was heartbroken, uh, longed over the corpse, and refused to eat or drink. Snorri, however, appeared to have a bit of a chip on his shoulder, and portrayed this all as incredibly demonic bad stuff, because when the corpse was cut open, vipers and toads and wicked things crawled out of it. So it was this like demonic, magical deception that is inherent to the Sami people, and that shows up a whole bunch. Because, yay. You just love to see the yikes takes coming out of the sagas. Mm. Uh, another one is in my like, Kettle Saga Hangs, where uh, the hero Kethel goes from his home on Hrapnista in Norway to the coast of maybe as far as the White Sea. It's not super clear. Uh, but meets a girl there and... Uh, She's finished, but some laps are coming in, and so they have to actually hide under a blanket uh, while the trading is going on. But as a result of that, as just proximity to the laps, the son they have, uh, Grimur Lodenkena, has a scraggly beard on one side of his face that can't be shaved, that will literally turn away a razor if you try and cut it. From the moment he's born. So, quasi-monstrous. That being said... They are clearly aware that the Sami people are not monstrous, because as early as the 9th century, oh, uh, we have from the court of Alfred the Great, Othera, who traveled to the Kola Peninsula and interacted with the people there and seemed fine with it. Seemed to recognize that they were just people. So, yeah. The mythological material and the historical reality might be a little bit exaggerated. Exaggerated. Da 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 da
Do 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 do. Could any of the stories in the prose Edda be made up? Yeah. Yeah, they could be. I don't have anything more. I don't really have anything more creative to say about that. Uh, right, there are some stories that are attested nowhere else that we have no visual evidence for. That we have no uh, external evidence from the prose Edda for. So there is absolutely a chance that they are, to some extent, made up. We certainly hope that's not the case. I don't. I don't see any reason. I don't see a strong reason to assume that most of it are made up. But some of it absolutely is. Also, some of it uh, is made up along classical models. This is almost certainly true. Uh, Richard Cole has an article on uh, Jewish stereotypes in the El Thursar and their description in the Prozeda. At uh, Ragnarok. So, you know, made up in the lines of adopting anti Semitism. You hate to see it. Gazition asks What is the difference, if any, between Norse and Germanic religion if they. Do they get interchanged? Old scholars fucking love doing this. They absolutely freaking adored it. Jakob Grimm is one of the big, big popularizers and defenders here. As in, by the way, this is Jakob Grimm, as in the brother of Wilhelm Grimm, as in uh, the fairy tale people. Uh, he literally t called his th his big book on Norse religious studies uh, Deutsche Mythology. That being said, they aren't this. They're clearly connected. We have some germ, old high German charms, uh, the Merseberg charms, which are actually in the Christian manuscript, but are genuinely pre-Christian. Uh, that describes some sort of healing thing, in which it appears that the sun is way more, like, a solar figure is way more important, and some of the gods are the same, but also not quite all of them. Uh... So let's throw out, throw out the Merseberg charms. So they're different in some important and obvious ways from the Norse mythological corpus, but they're clearly they're clearly related. And here's the thing: Norse and German and early English pre-Christian religions are all related, but they are not the same. And due to the highly localized nature of these religions at the best of times, there are some regional and supra-regional differences that really cause pretty big shifts in the cultural understandings. There are figures in Norse mythology that show up nowhere else, like Freya. There are figures like Sunna in the Merseberg charms that aren't in Norse mythology. Because the cognate should be soul, and soul is an incredibly minor figure. And we have almost nothing of early English religion to say one way or the other, but, you know, let's give B the benefit of the doubt. It's a bad plan, but let's do it. Ostara has no cognate in the rest of the Germanic linguistic world. So, yeah. 
This dude, yes there is mentions, I mentioned Paul Vatican earlier in the source material lecture. Uh, in his various works, he does have some descriptions of religious stuff. I just didn't have time to talk about it because time. Yeah, so they're related, they're not the same. The people who wanted them to be the same were doing pan-Germanic romanticism. In other words, the exact same shit Tastus was doing. Like, literally, saying, Oh look, no noble spirit of the Germans, this was great, this ancient thing that totally existed. It's what we should aspire to because it's better than what we've got now. The Nazis turned that dial to 12 when it stopped at 8. So there's a big ol' oof. Right, it starts as an oof. And it goes all the way to Nazi levels of oof. That's, it's a lot there. <laughs> okay, what's up next? Uh, let's see. So how common is euhemerization? Very. The prose editor does it. The external sources all do it. Uh, the sagas don't do it as much, but, so, euhemerization and or, actually, hang on, sorry, let me do, let me revise that. So, I want to talk about actually two different types of, uh, I was conflating two things that I should have confl conflated. Euhemerization, i.e. the belief that the gods are actually human and it is actual historical events that have been wildly distorted. And interpretatio romana, or the idea that the Norse gods are actually Greek gods. So, the as far as euhemerization, uh, Saxo does do it. Saxo does it all the time. Really hard. Saxo does it. Snorri does it in England Saga. And the Prozeta. Uh, do 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 do. Sartla. Thouter does it. So it's, you know, it's fairly common. Interpretatio Romana, all of the external sources do it. Uh, Saxo doesn't. Saxo thinks everyone's dumb for doing it. Uh, and Orvin, actually let me spell Orvin correctly, is compared at some point to almost every classical god. Uh, 
Almost every single one. The identification of Odin with Mercury is the most common one. But at some point, someone equated Odin with some with every available option. So that's that's a thing. Um, <laughs> so, next up, uh, do we know, sorry, uh, do we know if there were raids or migrations or incursions by Nordic or Scandinavian peoples into Germany or Gaul during or after the Roman period but before the Frankish Empire? Uh, yeah. It's been argued that uh, Roman trained uh, artisans helped make uh, the type A Gauth and Runestones. Uh, that's Anders Andren again, leading that argument. Uh, there's also trade routes existed since the Nordic Bronze Age at least. Uh, and genetic, uh, recent genetic study of Viking Age graves. says that there is Southern European and or North African DNA in the individual Norse genome. That's the that came out last year and is super rad. Uh, it's incredibly basic, right? It is pretty much the just, here is the data set, and some basic interpretations, and some fun facts, but it is rad. Hmm. So, those are just some examples. Uh, the trade routes uh, are, by the way, doing amber, lumber, furs, slaves. Those four materials are kind of the lifeline of international trade from Scandinavia into the rest of the kind of hemispheric world, which means we have Scandinavian amber as far away as Damascus and Egypt. So, yeah. Uh, next question. Nope, that, uh, preserved the same. That did not copyright. Is there any location in Norse cosmology such as Utgarder that could correspond for or to North America? TBH is for a book and we need only the slimmest excuse. Uh, sort of. Let me scroll, go back up to this uh, image. So obviously, you know, we have like Midgarther being, depending on how you want to read that, Europe or Eurasia, depending on how far you want to zoom out, and uh, how big you want to think their worldview was. Muspelheim is south, Niflheim is north. Then there's the ring of the oceans? By the way, Iceland tries really, really, really hard to make sure that it is part of Midgarther, and Greenland tries really, really hard to make sure it's part of Christian Europe. And Iceland also tries really hard to make sure it's it's way more Christian than Greenland is, we promise. And Greenland goes, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. We've, got, we've got Vinland over there. You can't call us not Christian, look at Vinland. Uh, but anyway, you could make an argument. I do not agree with this argument. I do not think it is a good argument, but you wanted a slim excuse, so I'll make the argument anyway. They can think of the ocean, and then 
uh, almost on the outside edge of that ocean surrounding the world, you have more land where, Yodin, where the Yetnar live. And so the Prozeta says that Snorri walks, or that Thor walks across the ocean uh, to get to Utgarðr. I think it's most likely that he's talking about, you know, the Baltic, if he's thinking of a real place. But yeah, no, let's, let's go for the crazy argument. Walks across to the Americas. Now here's the problem with that. The people who discovered North America, um, called it Finland, were Christian. Leifur Eriksson was converted to Christianity by Olavur Tryggvason five years before his voyage. Thorfinnur Karlsefni, who is the longest running settlement attempt, was Christian. Uh, Eric the Red's daughter, who led the probable, according to the sagas, led the last settlement attempt, dubious sister is uh, was a very bad Christian, was technically Christian. Anyway, next up. Uh, what do we know about Norse interactions with religions beyond just Christianity and any artifacts or writing that demonstrates this? The big in influence here is Finnish. Uh, Uko has a lot of cognates with Thor. To be honest, so does, you know, uh, Perkunas. And you can make argument also thinking of like even as far as Pedrun. We also have a uh, northern Polish material culture. Uh, BJ 5 one So we have some northern Polish material culture in Scandinavia which could show Slavic religious influences. Uh, Lesha Gardowa is kind of the lead scholar on this right now. He's at the uh, National Museum in Oslo and does some really cool research. Uh, he's done work with, like animal spurs as a particularly Slavic or animal shaped spurs uh, as a particularly Slavic piece of material culture that could indicate sort of spiritual, some sort of religious belief being in contact with Scandinavian belief and yeah, Finnish is the big one. We have quite a bit of stuff to think about uh, Finnish material as being at least loosely influenced by Norse religion, though. Uh, let's be very clear. Not a one to one thing. Trying to make it one to one is going to fail. It doesn't work. AC, I will get to you eventually. I have seen the question. We will get there. So, uh, those are a couple of examples as far as uh, Arabic stuff. Uh, I mean, Al Ghazali claims that he debates in paraphrasing phrases from 14th century claims he debated with the leading poets and philosophers of Dublin and beat them all because of course he did and Ibn Fadlan we know was not impressed uh, uh, by Norse hygiene. He actually probably over he probably overstates how filthy they were. Uh, next up, next up.
Do 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 Did the role of the head god of the Pantheon change or was stable? This is some quality Indo Europeanists um, isms, I should say. Tia equals Tiwas equals linguistically, Tia and Zeus are the same word. They both go back to, uh, I believe it's Dios is the reconstruction, and then I believe that's the Indo-Europe, the Proto-Indo-European construction. I don't super buy this. Right? Uh, cause that, this kind of makes a fundamental assumption. Um, why is Z Zeus the faithful reconstruction of the Proto-Indo-European status of this being, but tier is an alteration. That's argued by assertion way more than it's argued by actual evidence. There is actual evidence for it, but a lot of the things are mm, questionable. Uh, so, the usual argument is that Tia was at some point Long pre-Viking age, the head deity, and by first century CE at the latest, it has changed. We don't know why, but Odin comes on top. So yeah, like I don't buy this. I think there's also evidence, right? If we're just using the Proto-Indo-European stuff, right? If we're just making a linguistic argument, between Odin and Shiva, I believe, It's all linguistics. It's all a linguistic argument. As long, uh, last point here, as long as we have any source material to actually work on, Odin is the head of the pantheon. Put an asterisk on that, Except if Adam Brayman is accurate. Except if Adam Brayman is accurate. Because Adam Brayman says that Thor is the Head of worship at Gamla Uppsala. If he was right about that, then Thor is a regional variant of the head god. Which is fair. Right, that's, that's, it's fine. Thor was an incredibly popular deity, you know? There's actually a question about Thor. Uh, so, Thor. Exactly. Uh, Austin Town 999, you are correct. Uh, Terry, uh, and John. And Neil. And Stefan. 
Yeah, basically everyone has argued against the existence of a meaningful pantheon, but if we think about the back projection of the Lidrai mythology, uh, right, because ultimately what that question is about is about the Lidrai mythology. It's not about the pre-Christian Nordic religions, uh, and it's about how far back can we project the Lidrai mythology, which absolutely has a pantheon. And the answer is just not very far. And as long as, as far back as we could plausibly have any grounding to project it to, there's no reason to think that way. But yeah, I would agree with you uh, that in pre-Christian Nordic religion, we should not be thinking of uh, pantheons. Let's actually talk about that. As I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, pre-Christian Nordic religions are extremely localized. So we should what we should instead be thinking about is uh, local cult sites. A family group slash settlement has their god that they pray to. This might be Alvar. This might be Desir. These might be Thor slash Odin slash whoever. Thor and Odin and Uller and Freyr have cross regional popularity. So as far as we can think of a pantheon, we're looking at figures like these. Uh, Old High German Sunna might have something. Uh, who else? Who else would be plausible? I think that's about it. Maybe Frigg? For thinking in more cross-regional rather than hyper-regional. Uh, but does this look as an actual pantheon? Yeah, no. Not in terms of actual belief. When does a pantheon emerge? 10th century. This I am really confident on saying this is 10th century, and this might be evidence uh, vacation by elites due to a mix of political consolidation and alternative to Christianity's social benefit or social appeal. I mean, yeah, th there certainly is uh, a fair amount of scholarly assumptions that a pantheon ought to have existed. Because up until regrettably recently, there are two acceptable models for religious studies. You can either assume that all religions work like Christianity, or that all religions work with this romantic, idealized Greek religion. Those are or more accurately Roman. It's not even like truly archaic Greek. It's more accurately just like late period Roman. So yeah, you can either be a Roman model or you can be a Christian model, and no no religion could possibly work differently from either of those. <laughs> we love academia, we really do. Ah, uh, next up. So.
<sighs> is tier equals Lord of Justice something only lay people still think, or are there scholars who still use De Vries uncritically? Most people, most specialists have at least partly reject, partially rejected De Vries. Most. Uh, non, non-specialist academics still cite him. He makes us sad. There's also a, uh, Generational thing, uh, older scholars are usually more willing to cite him. Unfortunately, sometimes you still have to because there isn't an alternative. It's terrible. Absolute mess. So, what's up next? Ooh. Ooh, this is a juicy question. And, uh, by the way, I, I have noticed that there's another specialist in chat here. Someone found main found me on main and is helping out, which I appreciate, by the way. Uh, so I may need your help on this one, too. How did the Norse look at the idea of a soul? Complicated. Absolutely ungodly complicated. Uh, so... We can say pretty unequivocally that it existed. There is some conception of an incorporeal spirit. It's past that, there is really hard to say because we. Every... The thing I said about being hyper-localized, yeah, it seems to be incredibly hyper-localized. So, right, Ibn Fadlan says that cremation equals good because spirit goes directly to the gods and Instead of being trapped in earth. Burial mounds, these big inhumation burials, suggest the opposite is good. Except when they don't. Because there are sometimes burial mounds where the ship, that is, these big mound ship burials, where they'll burn the ship and then build a mound on top of it. And sometimes they'll just build, have the ship, and then put the mound on top of it. And sometimes they'll burn the ship first and then put the mound on. So that's great. Uh, so something like the Oseberg burial, I mean, suggests that there is an afterlife and there is the transport of material possessions into the afterlife, probably, maybe. Uh, given that the two women buried there had just a ludicrous amount of material goods and incredibly high value material goods. So, I presumably they're probably interpreting these goods as traveling with the person. Uh, and I'd say the support for that is Hagbui. Uh, Revenant, undead who like their goods to stay put.
And then, yeah, we get into, like, uh, Eirik Saga. And the idea of the Nauturur there. And then the Dísir. Her, Haming, yeah, uh, And there's another word I came across recently. Where was it? Da, 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 da. Another word for spirit. Hmm, where... Where is it? Um, I mean, it's not it's not weicht here. That's not a human spirit. Uh, I can't find it. It's in the same book. Uh, Outman, Outman wrote about that in one of these chapters in this book, I think. Whatever. It doesn't super matter. Uh, so, there are so much uh, going on there. Um, the conceptions seem to vary wildly, and unfortunately, every single thing that mentions, gives any sort of spirit a name, or any sort of soul of a name, is post-Christianization, -Christian and quite a long ways, except Ibn Fadlan, who is writing for an Abbasid audience and is absolutely translating terms to make sense in an Abbasid context. Now, it wasn't Filgir. Uh, it started with an L. Yeah, I'm annoyed. I can't, I'm annoyed I can't find it. Oh well. Unimportant. <laughs> uh, so. What is up next? Um... So, yeah, uh, let's go back here, um, next question. Another, another easy one. Let's just go for two easy ones back to back. Uh, new slide. How trustworthy are these sagas? My answer for this is, uh, lots of question marks. <laughs> because some of the sagas include incredibly ancient material. As I mentioned, Sertlathauter is a redaction of the Hjavningavig. That's literally like the oldest mythological story we have. Does that mean that Sir Lothauter tells the happening of Egg well? No. But it's clearly preserving oral traditions, and it's evidence that oral traditions can survive in a recognizable and relatively stable thing. For an incredibly long time. But... Each saga has its own individual agenda. And a broader cultural milieu. And level of learning of the scribe. And ch all that changes over time in different copies. Which means it's incredibly hard to say with any sort of uh, broad broad generalization 
as to how reliable the sagas are, because it changes literally all the time. Anyway, since it sounds like some of the regulars have to go, the next most important question is, of course, from AC Esquire. There is a correct answer, and it is this one. Everyone else is wrong. It looks like we have a younger Futhark, our medieval Icelandic, our elder Futhark, our early English Futhark, and Ogham. It is clearly medieval Icelandic, because those are the best runes. Alright, good night, folks. Alright. Last up. Uh, okay, follow up to that, to the trustworthy of the sagas. What should we be looking for in them? Again, uh, right. Mentions of either names of mythological people. So, right, in Sertlafautur, uh, Hild. Is a Valkyrie. Is a Val is a name of a Valkyrie. If Odin appears, that's potentially something. Um, any Landweichters, things like that, are reflexes. There's a fair amount of scholarship on how to do this. Uh, I actually just referenced one uh, with Arman Jakobsen uh, recently writing an article on that, the ideas, all the sources are spurious. Um, but to quote what... Let's just quote a paragraph here. Given the fact that the recorded sources all come from a fairly recently Christianized society, the Christian filter that the pre-Christian beliefs have passed through before they can be viewed by us must always be kept in mind in the quest for traces of the old faith. There is certainly a great interest, not always negative, in pre-Christian customs, but these are still by necessity always subject to the more hegemonic truths of the official religion. So, unfortunately, a lot of our things, a lot of our sagas are about the end of pre-Christian religion, either with, say, like, Olaf Saga Tregvasonet, as Olaf Tregvasonet was really big on the whole Christian Christianity thing, or you have all of the Islandic saga. Uh, dealing with, like, the last generations before Christian Christianity arrives. So. Uh, unfortunately, like, we have some good strategies. Like, as I said, names are a good one. And wherever we have other material we can reference against, we can kind of start to parse that out. And then we can assume consistency within a text. Right, if one text is really big on supernatural stuff, and one of those supernatural things is genuinely old, we can start to tentatively start looking at, well, are these other ones also genuinely old? Can we find other altered reflexes in other sagas? And slowly work our way backwards and in a very complicated, loose sense. But it's difficult. It's extremely difficult. But what can we do is what we've actually got. And yes, uh, these slides will be a separate video uploaded to the YouTube. So the lecture will be one thing. Uh, the Q&A will be another thing. And the whole can be viewed as a VOD here on Twitch. Okay. Awesome. So it seems like uh, people are starting to get tired. And to be honest, so am I. So we're going to do one more. And then we're going to, I think, call it a night. Hmm. Let's go for one more, one more super, uh, Easy to answer one because I choose nothing if not difficult questions. Does gender play into which afterlife one gets into? I noticed that women, to my knowledge, aren't portrayed in places such as Valhalla. Really, the focus seems to be on men. 
Do you have an explanation for this? I'm guessing there is something I am missing. There is not something you're missing. Regrettably. Female presences in the afterlives? Whether that we think that means either like Valhalla, Spirit World, Hell, whatever, are terribly, horribly neglected in the source material. Clearly, female burials are given a lot of care. There are some, there are some incredibly, incredibly uh, high status burials, such as the Elsaberg burial, and uh, as I mentioned in the lecture, the tradition, the emergent thing of like tenth century Thor's hammer pendants, uh, in placed on top of female graves, uh, suggests you know maybe some sort of relationship of uh, Thor. And a protection of feminine, of, of a specifically feminine context of Thor somehow being a psychopomp or protector of the spirit or something associated with specifically female burials. What that belief is doesn't survive. The literary mythology is incredibly male folks focused. How far back you want to project that into um, is a good question. I I go back and forth on this like every month as to whether I want to think that this is a very late development or whether this is actually a really old development, because, let's be honest, uh, the Viking Age society was not exactly... Mm, gender equality wasn't a thing, regardless of what the internet would like you to think. It wasn't. At all. It was better than Roman culture. But that's setting the bar underground. Uh, so... Right, another example of this incredible male focus in the Eddic material is that, you know, what happens to Freya at Ragnarok? We don't know. What happens to Freya at Ragnarok? We don't know. Uh, the only time Freya is mentioned in context with Ragnarok is that a uh, the devouring of Odin is called the greatest grief of Freya. And that's the only time she gets mentioned. Because clearly that's the only time, like, she has emotions that matter. The Eddic material is really kind of shitty to its, uh... Goddesses. Oh, yeah, you're right. In his list of the Alcinior, Snorri does mention that, doesn't he? Uh, thank you... Let me let me confirm that uh, to Anthony Fox because I'm not going to try and translate the Old Norse right now. <laughs> Give me just a moment here. Um, I know where it is. It's farther than there. Farther than there. That's Ragnarok, and that's the end. Okay. There it is. Uh, yeah. Fourth is Gevion. She is a virgin and is attended by all who die virgins. Yep. Snorri, Gilvigending, uh, chapter 35. Hey, no, no, no. I am using the accepted, like, the most common academic translation of the Prosetta. Also, yes, I am also a voice on the internet trying to, uh, tell you all to don't trust certain sites on the internet. Smart. <laughs> anyway. 
So, yeah, unfortunately. This is a really good question uh, that highlights the differences. Highlights... Uh... But, sorry, here's a question. Uh, like, Gavion is mentioned like hoist long in accounting for Freya. And is Ge is Gavion mentioned like anywhere else outside of the uh, Pro's Edda and like a couple of cannings? I don't actually know. And... Anyway, so yeah, I think that's where we'll leave off the questions. I'm noticing people are getting tired, and we have been going for a long time. So, uh, last call. Uh, we need... If you enjoyed this, please do consider supporting the channel. Uh, spread the word. Let people know about this sort of stuff, and let me know uh, in comments or with subscriptions or anything else. Uh, that you like this. Uh, if we get two more subscribers, we unlock another emote slot. Shh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I hope this has been informative and has been good context. Uh, and I hope a lot of you will join us tomorrow, uh, 11 a.m. Central Time, where Blue from Overly Sarcastic Productions uh, will be joining me for the Jotunheim arc of AC Valhalla. So yeah, uh, that'll be at uh, yeah, it's at eleven a.m. So five p.m. Uh, UK time for anyone in Europe, and that's going to be that's going to be wild, right? I talked a lot about how to better do Norse mythology, like you know how to read like a pro. Assassin's Creed, the development team clearly needed to talk to me first because they took none of none of this advice. Literally none of it. It's going to be a mess. Uh, so I hope you enjoy my suffering, uh, because that's what that's going to turn into very quickly. Uh, but yeah, I hope you all otherwise have a good rest of your evening, have a good weekend, and thank you all very much for coming. See ya!